welcome to Book Reading Hour. My name is Noel Joshua Hadley. We are reading this week, uh, He Walked the Americas, second session. This was last, last month's TUC book selection, of course, and we still have copies available in the, the bookstore online for anyone who would like them. They are cheaper and more affordable on our website than, than Amazon. I checked. They're selling for like $70 on Amazon. So much cheaper where we're at. All right. A couple of things I wanted to do tonight before we get started. I'm going to copy and paste this. And hopefully, Josh, you can kind of look at this. Oh, that's not what I wanted you to look at. Let's see if I can get the picture in there. All right. This is the Ten Commandment rock. It's the Las Lunas Decalogue stone. And it's just outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we were reading last week in the book about how the prophet, how he actually wrote in stone for the Native Americans, I think in the, the Southwest area, the Ten Commandments. Now, what I want to point out about this is that it, it, if that's legitimate, then it's very likely that Yahusha HaMashiach physically wrote that into the stone. What's even more important about it is that it's actually Paleo-Hebrew. Now, I want you guys to think about this as we go through the book, because, you know, the author, uh, L. Taylor Hansen, um, I'm not, you know, knocking the, the author of this book at all. She, she did tons of research to pull this material. She is looking at this through a lens of her maybe preconceived notions her biblical upbringing and so on and so forth. And so, you know, some of the things I read in here, I take with a grain of salt, but nevertheless, what the stone shows is that uh, Yahushua HaMashiach, when he walked the Americas, he was, he was a Hebrew. I mean, he's, he's teaching them the paleo and this explains why, you know, so many of the Native Americans have tassels and other things like that. Just wanted to point that out. Now, something I didn't start with last week, sorry for the crunching sound of the microphone, is I wanted to read to you this document that was sent to me. It was actually sent to Rebecca, and then she sent it to me. And this is just a quick bio on the author. And I thought this would be... Uh, I have it right here. I, I'm not, I'm not going to read this whole document. Maybe just take five minutes and go through some of this. I thought it'd be important. Maybe I'll insert this into the first video. So this is, and this is actually photocopies that she actually wrote on her typewriter. I mean, you could totally tell this is like, if you remember documents back in the day from the typewriter. All right. I was born just before the turn of the century to a young West uh, pointer. Uh, West Point, a uh, young West Pointer and his wife in a small broken down fort left over from the Indian War. So she's born in a fort on the frontiers to a uh, West Point officer during his first assignment after leaving the academy. Could that have been an omen of my later interest? My father would have answered in the negative after pointing out that my first nurse a maiden, a maiden of the Sioux Indians tried to get rid um, of a crying baby by tossing it down a winding flight of stairs. What the girl did not know is that my father, just entering the front door, had been on the football team at the point and was adept at catching forward passes. Perhaps that was an omen of a life of travel with overtones of adventure. Now, I'm unclear here. If she was the baby that was tossed down the stairs, she says a baby. And she, so maybe she's speaking about the Sioux Indians, just some random baby that she was taking care of, the maiden, or herself in the third person. But uh, nevertheless, it's a pretty crazy story. My second contact with the American Indian occurred. Okay, so actually this, this was her because that was her first contact with the American Indian was being tossed down the stairs as a baby. My second contact with the American Indian occurred in 1919 when I was taken into the Chippewa tribe with blood rights because I had suggested that a group of orators be sent to Washington to protest the tenure of agency doctor rather than just killing the offender. 
I was drawn into the discussion by accident. The fact is that I had to write a paper for a, class, for a college class. And since I was about to spend my vacation on Lake Superior in Michigan with a group of students, the subject of Indian legend seemed an excellent linking of pleasure and duty. It was here that I first heard the legend of the white prophet and regarded it with amusement as a garbled memory of early missionary instruction. My teacher agreed. So she's basically saying it's just mythology. Incidentally, I gained no, no great knowledge, merely the repetition of some uh, Br'er Rabbit type uh, talking animal stories, which meant nothing. But I did learn that I had a talent for getting into adventurous situations. My next contact with the Red Men occurred 10 years later, after I had a BA degree in some business experience, as well as some graduate study in geology and anthropology at University of California at LA. That would be UCLA. A great uncle had left me some $2,000. My parents, both being dead by now, I shook off all family proposals of various business ventures and took a grand old tour of the far north, ending up with a thousand with a thousand miles by dog team. Now, she has been criticized uh, by like you'll see. This is the one big thing I've seen her criticized for online. People who have read her bio uh, talk about how she took a dog team. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, people did take dog. This is over a hundred years ago, and people still kind of took dog teams up in the far north. So I don't know. During this never to be forgotten year, I had contact with many tribes and one more, uh, oh, once more, I'm reading from a typewriter guys. And once more, the reoccurring white prophet legend. I regarded this flood of white men with various names as most confusing, but I was becoming much interested in the migration legends of various tribes. Returning to more studied anthropology and now also archaeology as well as geology, I also began to write science fiction to pave my way. Gather, uh, I, she wrote over this word, I, I don't know, gain, I, gaining considerable recognition until the Great Depression began to bury the magazines, which had been my outlet. This is really kind of cool reading from this because it's like she, like, <laughs> You can see where she actually types over old words. You know, it's like she backs up and types again. It takes me back to like the 80s, at least, you know, when I used to read these kind of reports. Let's see. Um, then after a spell of illness, I went to Mexico to recover and there met Cedelio, chief of the Yaquis. With all due apology to the many brilliant scientists and other learned men, I have worked with and trained under at five universities. This red-skinned wild leader of his people was the most learned and the most brilliant. For in the first for the first time, I began to understand the symbolism of the legends and to guess the vastness and magnificence of the serpent empire Atlantic in origin, of whom he was one of the great sons or uh, heredity le leaders. All right, let's see. She kind of goes on from there and she kind of talks about, you know, learning more and more with the, um, let me just read the first last paragraph here. Thus has this book grown from the beginning of little knowledge and amused indifference, which we covered, to a larger knowledge marked by skepticism and finally into a greater knowledge of developing amazements, legend by legend, even as traveled, or even as he traveled, thus has been compiled through the years the legend of Quetzal the prophet. All right, so let's dive right into it. And uh, for those of you just arriving, welcome. We are starting out with his journeys to Michigan. And we are on... Believe it or not, of all pages, page 66. That's where we left off. Beside the shores, beside the shores of Michigami is the forest still called Sacred in the state called Michigan. Before his wigwam stood Dark Thunder, kindly chief of a 
Ochippewa. He was gazing steadfastly westward toward the water-reflected sunset and blowing smoke to the four directions. Toward him came the college student, the one the tribe adopted by blood rites and for whom there was warm affection. I think she's, I think she's talking about herself here. We'll find out. Crazy place to leave off. I did not uh, plan it that way. And that affection was more than mutual. That child of the white race found all these people charming. He had, well, maybe it, um, maybe this is someone else. He admired the agile and cat-like grace of the dancers, the smooth silken skin of the women, the quiet beauty of their language. At times, most hauntingly poetic in its phrasing, they lived in a world unknown to white men, a world in which the past was present, a past more distant than our histories. Upon their reservations, poverty-stricken and spirit-broken, the student was learning to see them through their own eyes. As the ancient ones and keepers of the olden knowledge, theirs was a very rigid culture with patterns that ran back to antique cities old before the rise of Egypt. There were proper ways to address one's elders, to enter a lodge, even to ask questions. My father, why are you blowing the smoke rings? Dark Thunder finished his meditation before he took his seat and began his answer. Because if you look across the water, which rolls from the bay, bay we call Kiwina, you will see it is touched with sun fire. Yes, that comes from the clouds of scarlet, which the sun paints as he leaves us to light the lands beyond the horizon. You learn well in the schools of the white man. You hint that there is another meaning? Yes, come and sit down here beside me. Know then that the fire path of the water is that traveled by the spirits who leave this realm for those beyond the sunset. Long ago, there came to us a prophet. He asked each tribe to name him, for to him names meant nothing. So we called him Wissa, Wissako, and we covered his paths with flowers so that he always walked on petals. Now he does the same for the spirits who leave us, and I was giving, giving Wate Si my blessing. Yes, I heard of her death this morning, a lovely young girl, her cheeks bright with fever. The coughing sickness of the white man, once touched diseases were unknown among us, but something in our blood seemed to invite them. Perhaps in the blood of white man is a substance which resists them, having been built up through the ages. Yet the blood of red man, having never coped with these diseases, does not have this resistance, perhaps. But tell me of this prophet, who paints the water with long dead blossoms? The same. What was he like? Where did he come from? Your desire for knowledge is a thirst never ending. Forget if you can't, if you can't read in the book, this is of course a dialogue back and forth. Forgive me if I am too inquisitive, but I have never glimpsed this knowledge, and my time here is short. A summer vacation is of such short duration to grasp even a fragment of it. I know my child. So I will tell you, though seldom do we speak of the past during the summer, perhaps because in the days of my father's when we lived freely in the forest, the summer was a time for hunting and the gathering of fruits, nuts, and berries against the rigors of the winter. Very well, let us speak of the prophet. He was bearded and pale of feature, without doubt a white man. His eyes were as gray green as still green water and just as changeable in their color. He came to us one day at dawning, and the light touched his hair with the sheen of red gold until it shone like newly mined copper. Yet he was not as the men of your people. This one was a god with high soul stature. If he touched a man who was wounded, that one became healed. His robe was long and white down to the hemline which almost hid his golden sandals. Everyone wished to make him white robes, for then he would leave behind the old ones, and all that he touched was enchanted with his godlike power of healing. Did he bring other priests with him? No, he came alone. He organized the churches, changed the temples, taught the priesthood. Some say he taught them a secret language with certain signs of greeting. I know not. 
I guess I would assume, I'm just assuming here, but a secret language could be, of course, uh, the Paleo Hebrew. Why do you call him the prophet? Because he not only walked among us, he also walked the realms of the future. Are you sure that he was not one of the black robes who came to this land with Columbus? I am sure. He came to, uh, probably referring to the, the Jesuits. I am sure. He came to us when we had cities more than a thousand winters before the days of the black robes and the long knives. When you had cities? Where are these cities? Below the cover of the forest. What a strange legend. You do not believe what I'm saying. You think I speak to you with a forked tongue. Oh no, I do not believe that you would deceive me. I am enchanted with the antiquity. Where are these cities? The ruins have been scattered by white men. Well, that's interesting. Then tell me the location of just one city. The city which we call the sacred is not far from here. Its history is longer than that of England's London. But, my child, you ask too many questions. If I had listened to my elders with half of the interest with which you listen, I might have had more to tell you. But I thought too much of swimming in the blue sea and running races through the forest. My father, for what you did here, I thank you. Yet I must ask of you a very great favor. Find for me another chieftain who will speak to me of these cities. I'd like to know the same. Well, these well, tell me about the cities. Why would you have why would you have us do this thing in summer when it is not our custom? Because I want to write down these stories. Just to spread them among the white man so that he can laugh at us and speak lightly of things about which he knows nothing? No, someday I must make a book of such stories, not for the amusement of white man but for the teaching of your grandchildren's children beyond our time. Many generations. Already there are few who can tell these stories. Are there any others around here that know them? No, I would have to bring such a one from a great distance. You see, soon all these legends will be lost. I would know of these cities. I would speak to the future, perhaps beyond our lifespan. For a book is a bridge from the past to the future, upon which we stand for this brief moment. Even though she's saying that this is a guy, I'm really thinking that this is her. My child, you speak with the tongue of the red man, and knowledge beyond your number of winners shines from your words. Once we had books and priests to read them, but those were times long distant in the past. Did you hear that? He just said, he said they had cities, and in those cities they had books. But those books are all gone. What happened to all the books? Books are of stuff which can be swept to oblivion. Since then, we have placed our stories in the chants of our people. But now even those are being forgotten. Your oldest books to us are but of yesterday. And how long may, la uh, how long may last these papers of your people? Yet you are right. The chants are dying. I, too, would like to reach other tribes of our people and share with them our ancient history. Is there still alive a chancer of the legends? There is one. He lives at some distance. Go now and let me think on this problem. Come back in eight days and we will talk further. I may let them know the time of his coming, and if he will, be willing to chant in summer. There may be more than one, and then there will be translators so that you may not miss the beauty of the language. Come back after the sun has gone eight times to the horizon, and speak of this thing to no other person. Then perhaps during a night when a searching star is shining, we will journey back to the times of the prophet, when the land was peaceful and we lived in cities. The student was new in the lore of the red man, yet one fact became instantly obvious. Thirteen was the prophet's number, although eight was also important, and five, the number of their difference. In due time came the night of the chanting. There were present many sages, proud old men of noble bearing, and apparently all of different languages. Their names have long since been forgotten, but never the drama of their movements and the melodic poetry of their phrases. In a very poor translation, here are their stories. All right, so page 72, Michigan, an old 
Chippewa Speaks. From his seat cross-legged upon his blanket across the old warrior, marksman, for a moment he waited the tribute of silence. A mighty specimen of manhood was marksman. Although in years he was almost 80, his figure had the lynx grace of the young man. His long hair, neatly braided, still had the sheen of the blackbird. His teeth were as strong and white as his grandson's, and his eyes were still keen for the signs of the game trail. It is well tonight that we speak of the pale god, and fitting as well that we counsel with others, greeting our enemies as brothers, for such would have been the wish of the prophet. I have heard some talk among the lodges that the lord of wind and water was but a myth brought down by the old ones from times beyond our present reckoning. This is true, but what a strange legend. If the youth among our people doubt the wide-flung strength of this ancient story, look about at his symbols from tribe to tribe across the broad land. Have you ever wondered about the cedar? Why does every tribe rever revere it? Why do the high priest mix his shavings with the leaves of our tobacco? To enhance its power, they will tell you. And why do we blow with smoke across our bodies when we are returning from the war trail? Is it not to ask his forgiveness, as was once taught by the pale god? Why do we plant these trees upon the great mounds, those ancient histories of our cities? Was it not to warn all men that once he walked there, the sacred one, the miracle worker? And the color of snow among all the nations, it stands for peace. Why is it so? Because he wore it. From nation to nation, he taught the people to live in peace and to speak in council, thus settling all the problems. This is what was his way and the way of his father. Why do we raise our hands up in greeting? Because that was his peace sign, a tradition which we still follow. Why do we use the cross as a sacred symbol? Was it not because he wore it about the hem of his full white garment and carried the sign on his two hands? those hands so gifted in healing. And that would, of course, be the sign of the Tav, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. How many here have ever seen the sun dance? I know that our brothers, the Cheyenne and Dakota, probably bear its scars on their bodies. Let us consider for a moment this strange dance, a self-torturing agony of suffering as danced by the young men. The ancient ones have told us that once this was a flying dance about a high pole, and that it came from the old red land now formerly sunken for many ages below the green waves of the ocean. Perhaps it once belonged to the wind god, which the serpents made a dance of sacrifice in the times long vanished, many cycles before the prophet's coming. This seems very probable because the prophet must have changed it and made it a dance of penance. Today, as a sacrifice for their people, the young men allow the the thongs from the tall pole to be tied under a two-finger wide strip by opening the skin of each breast, then dancing night and day for four days until they drop and are again freed from the suffering of the sun dance. Is it not strange that we hang our young men thus in pain upon a dead tree? I know not why, but we feel that a blessing or a righting or wrong of wrong is certain to follow. Our tribe no longer dances the sun dance. But we still remember the prophet. In the Wisaku Lodge and many others, there are some who still know his secret language, but those things are being fast forgotten. Yet to him who walked away through the silver moon frost, across the winter's snowy blanket, toward the north, where now is Canada and many other tribes of our people, I bid you see him as we saw this man. From the pines, uh, from the pines, dripped ice like unlit candles as he walked away. His snowy garments made him seem wraith-like, while his long hair was silvered by his frost breath. Two wolves followed behind him, one of dark fur and one of silver. We knew that they would not harm him, for he had a strange power over the animals, the fiercest seeking the touch of his fingers. Thus he left us, and to him I raised the peace pipe, the tobacco mixed with cedar shavings, and blow the smoke to the four directions, 
thus making the sign of his cross. For tonight I have spoken. Well, that's really interesting with the two wolves that would follow him around. Um, speaking of the, well, we all know about the line of the lamb, and it says wolf and the lamb now, but all speaking of the Isaiah 11 prophecy and the, the peace that followed him everywhere. All right, now we're in South Dakota, the voice of the Dakota. Page 76, if you need caught up. At the Chippewa Lodge, a tall man was arising. With a, with a life grace, he shifted his body, waiting for the murmurs to die into silence. In the full dress of the Dakota, he was a proud and exotic figure as the firelight played over his costume. Finally, quietness came, and the rippling whispers ebbed away to a sea of silence. And now he's speaking. Never before that I can remember have the Chippewa invited a Dakota warrior to address them in council. No wonder seeing this costume, there were many subdued whispers. Yet too long as enemies have lived, our two tribes, and for that matter, all the Indian peoples. Anciently, we came from the same homeland. Do you not read that in th these symbols used again and again in our costumes? It is so through all it is so through all of the tribes westward. Indeed, it is time we dropped our dark frowns and learned to smile upon one another, seeking together our ancient history, for it is broken and shattered among, among us in legends, which need many retellings in many languages for the light of truth and understanding. I was invited here to speak of Wyakoma, the fair god who ruled the ocean and spoke in whispers to the windstorm. Our name is not the one you gave him, for when he came, we lived far to the southward, where the sun makes shorter shadows and our cities were built on islands, many of which have since gone down into the ocean. After he left, we forgot his teaching and we, we return to the ways of the fire god. And that's a, another little interesting note there on the, um, the lands that have now sunken into the ocean. As our land became scarcer due to storm and great earth shaking, one tribe among us sought to be master. They began conquering city after city. We, the dispossessed who would not live in slavery to those who had our same heritage, sought the mountains, many tribes in council. From our traders, we knew of the Mississippi. And so in our long canoes, carrying our sacred fire, we began our migrations. We of the turtle, keepers of the books and learning, led the many tribes of the serpent up the great father of, the, of waters. To commemorate that, we built the great mound of the serpent led by the tortoise. It is too bad that, that we had to take your cities. Many years had we lived in peace and traded, but sometimes we moved but to fill the billy. Such was our move into the woodland among the herds which were to be had for the taking. And when one has hungry children, those herds meant life. Such was our move up the Mississippi. Near white man's town, St. Louis, where stood your great capital city, we built our capital. That just got really interesting. St. Louis, of course, is uh, one of the ancient cities. Uh, it's where the World Fair was. We did not destroy the crest of your building where you had written your history. We but added to them. White man was the destroyer of both your history and ours also. You realized our need and you moved northward and there was peace between us. Then there grew up in the capital city of the black tortoise, Dakota, who sired our tribe. He had a great dream for the red man. He dreamed of a mighty kingdom, solidly won from the sea of the sunrise to the sea of the sunset. He could not gain the emperor's attention and he left for the northern cities where lived your people. Now, though you had been a peaceful nation, his pleadings did not go unattended. Ears were open to what he was saying. In the West, there is much fighting. Fierce warriors came from the Northland, bringing great war dogs with them. We call them the men of the coyote. They burn and plunder and carry away the women. 
Now, I would force them into cities. I would conquer them and make them peaceful. I would build one mighty nation, as in the old red land, which we both remember, which was ruled by two together. So I would have you rule with me this mighty country. In your cities of the Northland, you listened to the voice of Dakota. You gave him armies to train and your sons to learn the arts of warfare. Dakota was a mighty general. He conquered the tortoise empire and made his own mound after the tortoise mound of extinction. He might have succeeded in his dream, except the more of the hordes of the northern coming afresh down the west coast decimated his armies, and then civil war broke out over the Dakota empire. Cities were abandoned, and each tribe took the, to the forest to raid and pillage and play at war games like naughty children. And remembering back, our wise men told us that once great Wyacoma predicted that it would be so, even to the final coming of white man. Now, when it is too late, we remember. You asked me to tell you of great Wyacoma. Our memory of him is greatly garbled for so long ago was he living. We know that he prayed to the dawn star, and today, in his memory, our most sacred lodge carries that name. To the memory of him, I make his symbol, and for this night, I have spoken. Right, the next story comes from Oklahoma, the Southerners speak. Now, there arose from his blanket one who was dressed in white man blue jeans. His hair was short, cropped, and his feet knew not the Indian moccasins, but were clad in shoes of leather. He spoke slowly in the tongue called English. We are the Southerners. Formerly, we lived on the lower Mississippi. We, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Creek. When white man came, we had log cabins built around our wooden temple raised on a high mound. We were the last to come up the Mississippi, except for the Natchez, who no longer walked the green earth. Over the Trail of Tears, we were deported westward to the land of Oklahoma, and there we met the men of the Osage. Our memories of the prophet were dimmed by the ages. Among the Choctaw, he was known as Emi Shi, the wind god. For strange are the tales which are told of his power over the heavens and the winds which speak with the breath of the spirits. It is said that he told us of white man's coming. And when he did, his eyes had a sad look as if seeing about him the scenes of the future. Once he said, all my life have I struggled against this thing called the law of the jungle. Are these bearded ones who are still my children going down war's tra uh, trail to final destruction? and thus give the last human victory and death to the law of the jungle. He was sad that day as he spoke unto us, for he was leaving us to travel northward, perhaps to you, the Chippewa nation, for this was before our migrations when we too lived far to the southward where the sun makes shorter shadows. We would find out much more about him if like this we had many council tribe to tribe. We would learn more about ourselves also. This I know. We, too, once had had secret languages, but I know not if they are still remembered. The women had a secret language among themselves. It was not taught to captive women. Then there was the language taught in certain lodges. That was the one he taught us. It would be interesting to study this language if this were possible between tribe and tribe. It might tell us from whence he came to us and how long ago he walked among us. In our land of Oklahoma, where our plows turn the good earth and our cattle graze on the brown hills, I have often seen his symbol among the women's work who still weave baskets as I ride to other camps trading. Sometimes it is woven with the star of the morning or the cross of four directions or the symbol of the cedar, sacred tree of ceremony. Not only this, but something else comes to my mind. Once, when riding my pony to another camp, I saw some old pottery shards sticking out of the earth on top of a large hill. There was a cedar on the hill. I walked up and smoked a cigarette rolled with cedar shavings. Then I picked up the shards. On them was drawn winged beings. Carefully, I put them back, and then I made inquiries to all the wise old men of different tribes. 
They told me that the healer had said something about winged beings singing at his birth. Do you have this memory of the prophet's teaching? This is about all that I remember, except one thing. Even today, when we hear the weird music of the wind, we whisper to one another. Be quiet and chant the old prayers, the peace chants with which he opened the councils. For that is the great e mi shi chanting with the singing spirits in the wind song. To his name still unforgotten, still beloved among the people, I too take the peace pipe and send the smoke to the four directions where his feet trod over the wide land. For this night I too have spoken. All right, page 81, we are moving up to Canada territory. The legend of the sacred city in Canada. Next to rise before the assemblage was an aged man whose hair had been whitened by more than a hundred winters. Seldom does one see white hair among the red men, and when one does, it is almost a certainty that his snowy summit was attained at a hundred. He was reverently introduced by an Ochippewa who called him by the title of my grandfather, a term of the highest respect among the red men. His costume was unknown to my interpreter. The leather of whitest doe skin was embroidered by the dyed quills of the porcupine, and his moccasins were beautifully beaded. Perhaps sack and fox or uh, minnow mini, whispered my interpreter, or again he may be of the Canadian Northwoods, or from a tribe now facing extinction, of whom perhaps he is the last high priest. How do you know that he is a high priest? See you not see you not the wing fan from the sacred eagle? You ask me here to speak of the healer and the ancient days of our people's greatness. I was surprised to receive such an invitation. Are our young men having a change of spirit? Since when have they listened to the chanting? Have they ceased their love of white man whiskey, truly known as devil water, which looses, looses their tongues and makes them foolish? Yea, it is true my heart is bitter, but I came not here to give a lecture. Let white man keep his reason st st uh, stealer, for in time it will bewitch him. The reason stealer would be the, uh, the devil water. I came to take you back to the ancients and to the times of our people's greatness. I have thought of taking the legends with me even into the land of shadows. But the young man who came so far to seek me reasoned well before the fire. He said I had no right to take them, for they belonged to all our people as long as one red man walked the planet. They must go on past this generation and to the unborn soul who might be listening and wishing to walk back to the ancients. Therefore, tonight I'm here to take you walking back through the dawn star cycles to a time long distant when the land was not as you see it, past the memories of our grandfather's grandfathers. I take you with me to the days of the healer and the times of our people's greatness. These were the days when the crest of our histories whirled through many cities always near the mighty rivers, avenues of ancient commerce. So right there, he, he talked about how, of course, the cities were uh, always near rivers. Now, I mean, that's kind of like a no duh, right? I mean, you know, for co commerce purposes, but we know that uh, the water played an integral part in these ancient cities beyond, beyond trade. Coming north from our capital city, where the Mississippi meets the Missouri in the long boats of the traders, the prophets made his journey toward the city we called sacred. This was an ancient metropolis. Before we built its mound of extinction, after the great civil war of the turtles, 96 dynasties of rulers had lived their long and eventful history. Like the capital, like the capital, it too had strawberry carpets about all the buildings built upon the great crest, and from them the streets radiated outward among the dwellings of the people. This city was called sacred because it was in the center of the cross of waters from whence ran the rivers to the four oceans. East to the sunrise ran the waters, and northward to the sea of dancing lights. To the west beyond the great divide, the waters ran to the sea of the sunset, 
while the Missouri and Mississippi ran to the southern sea, the Sea of the Caribs. To this, the city of the Great Cross of Waters, up the river called the Father of Waters, one golden morning, came the heaver. The dawn cascaded down upon him as he left the ships of the merchants, painting his hair and beard with beauty and lighting up his lofty features. The streets were uh, mosaic with flowers strewn and homage on the path before him as he walked toward the temple. Greatly beloved now was the pale god, known as the lord of wind and water. His every move bespoke his kindness. His very touch revealed his divinity, and before him all the people bowed down. Through rows of worshipers he moved to the temple in quiet solemn, solemnity, holding up his hand in blessing, that hand with the strange palm markings, for through it was engraved the true cross which he had taken as his symbol. There at the temple he abode among us, though he often rode away with the merchants, or more often walked to distant villages, holding in his hand his great staff, and stopping to speak with all the people from the age to the children. Once there was a great stir among the villages. Messages had been flashed with obsidian mirrors and the smoke puffs of more distant signals. They spoke of an array of nobles who were coming to the sacred city from a land called Golden Tallinn. At first the people were much frightened, for though long had we traded with distant uh, Tallinn, Yet if these emissaries were to be followed by their mighty metal-clad armies, the Puan cities would be lost. The prophet was the least disturbed. He gathered about him a council of the merchants and soon had mastered the Toltec language. These men in peace were coming northward. He told the frightened people, and shortly the messages confirmed his story. Before long, Will confirmed were his statements. Indeed, they were coming to take back the healer to the city of Golden Tula, a fantastic place of magnificent beauty. Grand preparations were made to receive the emissaries. Long were the lines of chanters, the dances most elaborate, and much practice went on with conch shell trumpets, flutes, and tom-toms for the grand celebration. Then at last the day dawned, and the long boats were sighted coming up the river, in the lead, as was proper, came the ships of the Puans, laden down with goods of commerce, and following them, the ships of the Mayans and some other forgotten peoples. At last came the beautiful ships of Tolan. From that first ship came the guards all clothed in metal, and then a shipload of glittering musicians playing upon many strange instruments of music. Um, and they put here as a note, these strange instruments were Harps and guitar-like instruments were pictured in Yucatan, Bancroft. That's interesting. The last two ships were filled with the emissaries. So it's almost like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm wondering if these instruments, you know, came from European culture or even Middle Eastern culture, like the lyre and so on and so forth. The last two ships were filled with the emissaries. Most lordly stepping were these nobles as they came down from ships' houses, and all the people were hushed with admiration. Long and thick were their emerald feathers, unlike any seen by the Puans, flowing backward like rippling water. Their costumes were made of colored cotton embroidered with gold, with pearl and emeralds, and even their sandals were shining with beauty. Proudly, they walked behind their honor guard as they made their way to the great temple, where framed in the painted great log doorway of the prophet, the prophet stood quietly waiting with his shining hair and wearing his snow-white mantle embroidered with crosses about the hemline. It is said that the strangers brought many presents, among which were snowy garments and a pair of golden sandals, which indeed he wore forever after. The Mayans, too, laid gifts before him and received from him the blessing. However, when after four days passed, the ships departed without the healer, the joy of the people was tempered with sorrow when they learned that the pale god had given his promise to go one day soon to Tolan, after he had visited first with other nations. The Mayans, too, and the other peoples all returned happily down the river, for they all carried back a promised visit. 
For them, this was a thing for rejoicing. For it was a well-known fact that the healer never broke a promise. The prophet went both north and west with his long staff and his golden sandals and his snowy garments, and never more was seen by the Puan peoples. But word came back some four years later that he was on his way to Tolan, where a kingly reception awaited his coming. He went by the way of the Chihuahua Valley, which means the highway of ancient power. Then came the fabulous tales of the merchants of his entrance into Tolan, when one when on a day that has never been equaled since among all the nations, the earth stood hushed and breathless when that wondrous divinity we call the pale god walked down the highway into golden Tolan. It is sad for me to retell this story, for the memory of the present comes through to haunt me as if in terrible mockery. Yet I chant it for you, the young men who listen and for generations will again retell it, on into the cycles of the future as long as a son of our blood still walks the planet. Thus for you of this night, and for those even more distant in time from those living this hour, I have spoken. In bitterness had I sworn that these pictures would fade with the brain which carried them forward. But it is true that I had no right to think that, and so I release them into the future, to that, to that perhaps unborn soul who will still listen and love them, as I, when a boy, would crouch listening about the firelight and walk in, enraptured in spirit through a day so long vanished, I, too, have spoken. All right, visiting the, uh, the people of Wyoming, the, the Cheyenne speak. Then in the lodge of the chip, oh, we're on page 86 of you guys, if anyone has arrived and he's caught up. Then in the lodge of the Chippewa arose a slender man of the Cheyenne. There was a brief murmur at his costume as the Chippewa recognized another uh, hereditary enemy tribesman. Proudly, he too waited for the courtesy of silence. When it finally came, he began speaking. Like my brother from the Dakota, too seldom is seen the Cheyenne costume in the lodges of the Chippewas. We too look back through the vistas of history to the days of the old red land when there was peace and commerce on the mighty fathers of waters, on the mighty father of waters, known to men as the Mississippi. Like the Dakota, we use 26 poles in our teepees, which in our language means mountains, for we too think of ourselves as men of the mountains who anciently, uh, that might be a, a typo there. It, I would think that'd be brought, who, anxious, who anxiously brought their water from the snows of the high peaks in conduits down to our cities. I always have to point out another typo from, from another author because I make them myself. I'm like, they did it too, right? It's right there. The 26 poles are for each of the twins of the morning evening star giving each 13, which is its number. Like our brothers, we remember the fair God who foretold the coming of white man. Yet so long ago was he living that like the Dakota, our memories are garbled. Four years ago, I went to the West Coast to seek work in the motion pictures. There, so this is like, you know, the 1920s or 30s by this point. There I... There I met Indians from many nations, and all were courteous and more or less friendly. One particular man at Yakima from Washington told me this about the fair God. When he came to the Yakima people, they called him Tacoma. And so greatly did they pay him reverence that they renamed their highest mountain in honor of his coming. That's a very, seems like a very familiar name, Tacoma. My friend said that when Tacoma left them, he promised the sorrowing people that one day, through the light of the dawning, he, Tacoma, would return to them. Through the long vistas of the moon, the sun and the dawn star, the people still remembered this promise and always faithfully watched for Tacoma, and dying, told their children to keep on watching. Then one time, a great ship came into the harbor. On the deck were men who were bearded carrying rods which killed at a distance. The people were alarmed and amazed, but their chief, 
who was named Seattle, remain, reminded them of the fair God who had not told them the manner of his coming. So to the ship they brought presents, food of all kinds and cool fresh water, carved work and other trinkets. The bearded ones took the presents, smiled and were friendly, but they sailed away without remaining. Many years later, the people learned that this was not Tacoma, but Sir Francis Drake of England. As my friends listened to this story, there was among them a man from Hawaii. He told a similar story. Once there came to them the fair god whom they called Wakia. This god-like one healed the injured, raised the dead, walked on water and taught the people. When Wakia left, said the Polynesian, he promised that someday he would come back to them through the dawn light. Through countless generations, cycles the people still remembered, teaching their babes and then their grandchildren to keep watching the dawns for Wakia's coming. One time, a great ship came to them. The people met it with rejoicing, bringing presents to the bearded white men, fruits and food, and entertained them with feasting. Yet the white men did not remain among them. They sailed away, and the people, embittered, wondered if Wakia had rejected his people. True, they had not entirely lived up to his teachings. There had been some war and fighting, but on the whole, through the long, long years, they had tried to remain faithful. That night, a great storm struck the island. Was this another sign of Wakia's displeasure? The people were hurt as they thought upon it. Then they saw the ship returning. It was running like a frightened dog for cover, heading back to the safety of the harbor. Now the people knew that this was not Wakia. The fair god had full command of the sea and windstorms. He had but to hold high that slim hand, and the mightiest storms obeyed him. These men were but impostors, pretending with their beards to be Wakia. So the surprised white men met an army of warriors who swarmed over the ship and killed the explorers. It was years later that the Polynesians learned the truth of the story of misunderstanding. These men probably had never heard of Fair Wakia. This was but James Cook, the explorer, trying to map the wide Pacific for a distant island named England. For this night, I have spoken. All right, now moving back to Michigan. The council is closed. Of course, this whole thing took place in Michigan. This council. The last man ended his story and sat down with the final expression. Tonight, I have spoken. Then our host arose, dark thunder. Slowly, he looked about him in the tent where we sat around the great fire. Outside, the wind sang through the leaves of the forest, and the sound made a sighing music. My heart is heavy to hear these stories. The feathers of my soul are drooping, yet almost as if foretelling the present is the manner of the prophet's going. He left our people one night when it was snowing. He was to go to the Cree northward to Canada, and after seeing the people northward, would turn toward the sunset and the western river running toward the sunset ocean. They say that as he walked onward, the snowflakes danced through the skies in patterns. There were two wolves which were always with him, and now they followed his, his footsteps. One was white and one was dark silver. He had laughed when they had offered to guide him, for he had often gone with the merchants and he knew the country well. Thus the people saw him leaving in an aura of dancing snowflakes, where it was before a living forest like ours tonight. He faded into the wilderness like a wisp of smoke is lost in the snowstorm, leaving only millions of moving snowflakes swirling about in fantastic patterns. Remembering this and how he predicted the distant coming of white men, like the snowflakes which blow in from the ocean, I am suddenly stricken with sorrow. Once we lived in the wild free forest on a planet just as the great spirit made it. Now that world is changed and sullied, and the red man walks away sadly through millions of engulfing snowflakes, lost like a wisp of smoke in the snowstorm. For this night I have spoken. All right. Washington, Oregon, California. The Western Seaboard, page 91. In Michigan, according to Dakota, 
is the ancient censer of the giant cross of waters. To the south goes the Mississippi, to the north the river, to the pole star ocean, to the east the waters, to the sunrise, and farther west those to the sunset. Along this trail towards the sunset trod the master's golden sandals. No tribe was too remote for his sacred visits, none too poor for his ministrations, none too warlike for his counsels. If he heard of a war, he went there, called the chieftains into conclave, divided up the territory, gave them seeds, and taught them gardening. So I don't know if you're you're catching on to this. Wherever there's a war, he's going and talking to them. And we've been seeing this all throughout the book. And he's literally going around and trying to build this kingdom where he's bringing peace on the earth. I mean, I know that this is probably not how a lot of people think about the Millennial Kingdom, if this is indeed in the time frame of the Millennial Kingdom, and I think it is. Uh, but, you know, mankind still had a choice to rebel. And in fact, they, they did, and they seem to hint that the, their downfall, their, their rebellion led to the promise that they would be conquered by these, uh, you know, as we get in the official narrative, the Spaniards and the, the French and the English and so on and so forth. Anyways, uh, this is him speaking. Do not kill unless you are hungry, and then ask the animal's forgiveness and explain your great need to him before ever you pull the bowstring. This is a rule that never a red man would be so rash as to violate. So before the hunting, each tribe holds a prayer dance of olden ritual. Always he was called the feathered serpent, uh, Imishitolt or Isikoto among the Algonquins. This is kind of freaking me out because the plumed or feathered serpents uh, were names for the watchers in the old days. So this is kind of freaking me out. Always he wore the long white toga embroidered with black crosses along the bottom and walked through the dust with golden sandals. Whenever the people made him new garments, he left with them the old ones, which they uh, treasured beyond all wampum saying that to touch them was healing. During each of his visits, he trained 12 disciples and one to be their leader, who would accede to his title after he had gone about my father's business. After his visit, the grieving tribesmen carved the hand with the T-cross upon the walls of canyons so that none would forget him, and they could show to their children's children the eternal emblem of his coming. To the uh, Chinooks, wait, hold on. Is it saying, okay, so he's not carving the, um, the Tav signs. The, um, the tribesmen are doing that. To the Chinooks, the prophet came. Once when learning on his, leaning on his long staff, he pointed to the plain below them. Down through the cycles of the dawn star, I see below a spread city, which shall be named Tacoma. It is a city of the white man. What are you saying, master? Your name is Tlatkoma, meaning Lord Miracle Worker, the great white mountain where sleeps the fire god bears your name, Tlatkoma, not the plain below us. Yea, but the mountain bears another name, and few of the men who live in the city and use the name Tacoma will understand the olden meaning. The hot springs of Tacobaya mark the passage of the healer while in the canyons of nearby Kaso, where so lightly sleeps the fire god, there is a canyon of ancient recording, and in this long and silent gallery is the hand which the T crosses, and near it the great cross, olden symbol of the master. To the land of the Havasu, the healer came one early dawn, climbing down a steep trail into the great dividing canyon, with the sunrise sun behind him, they saw he of the white robe coming. The flame of the dawn touched his golden sandals. And long before they saw him raise one arm in greeting, meaning peace and prosperity to you, they whispered to one another, he comes to us, the great Tecobia, the mighty master miracle worker. Then with the whole tribe watching, they saw him stop and tap a large rock in the midst of the desert dryness with his long staff. And behold, there gushed forth water. He stooped and drank from the sacred water, which is still called the spring 
of Tacobia. I need to look that up because it's basically accrediting him with a miracle on par with Moshe tapping the uh, the rock with the staff. And who knows if this is the same staff, but uh, the water is gushing forth from this rock and he's uh, bending down to drink it. And it's a spring to this, this which is still called the spring of Tacobia. Maybe somebody can look that up for me uh, while we go through this, if it exists. To the Pueblos Tla Acoma came, who then were the outpost cities of the great empire of Tola, capital city of the Toltecs. Their lands were peaceful, their plantations extensive. In those days, they did not need to hide on mesas to keep away from wicked raiders. For long was the lance of the Toltec armies to protect their outpost. To the Wallapai tribe came great Tacopa, who gathered the chiefs in giant conclave and redistributed the grain fields. Then he taught them more clever gardening, gave them melon, pumpkins, and miscal, squashes, and beans. He showed them how to conserve, conserve water in hidden underground reservoirs. Many other plants he gave them, which have been lost throughout the ages. To the people of the White Rocky came, they told him that they had come here after the Great War in the Southland, where all their cities were left burning, and they themselves but a splinter of a once mighty power. Sad in their hearts and ever homesick, they remembered their disaster. They say that he told them of another nation which had to flee oppression in days long vanished. And then he showed them the beauty of their new land and how to make their gardens prosper. When he was ready to leave the Pueblos, again he called the chiefs to council. When he told them he was going, they were desolate with sadness. Heavy are hearts and darker future on that day when you will leave us. For there are tribes westward known to men as the sacrificers. Someday they will overwhelm us. Then unto these serpent people will I go, and I will teach them. Yea, but will never more we see you? In truth, I give to you a promise. Keep you my precepts, forsake all warfare, and you shall ever have my blessing, even beyond white man's coming. And woe to the hands that are raised against you. But will you come back to us, great master? Yea, if to my teaching you are faithful, and to show that you have lived each day rightly, leave a light at night burning against the time I will return through the dawn light and lead thee into my father's kingdom. So every night a light is burning in Acoma and other pueblos among these tribes, which we call heathen. All right, moving on to Arizona, the, the Hopi Snake Priest, page 94. The snake priests of the Hopi stood near the edge of ancient Wapai and with folded arms surveyed the desert below. Thank you for the condor feather. You say you got it from the great zoo? For us, it is a bird of legend. It is that for all the tribes of the American Indian people, I told him. Behind him, the old fortress upon the mesa top made a background for his figure, beautifully clothed in his native costume. His skin, light for that of many Rizkin people, was an innocence of hair as the cheek of a young child. That fact with this beardless people proved that he had no blood of white man. For a moment, we continued to stand in silence. To speak too soon or abruptly would prove only that one had little breeding in the quiet, ceremonious world of the red man. So I continued to stare at the ancient mud brick city, already old when the Aztec monarch first heard of white man's coming. You wrote to me in your letter that you wished to speak to me of the pale god? Of those days now few men remember? That I have learned, yet I would put those days in a book for reading so that young red men will remember the ancients, the heritage of all you people. He sighed and glanced back at the Pueblo. Perhaps in your book you will write of my people, of their kindness, their old traditions, their peaceful ways, and their love of beauty. We belong here on the desert. It is a wild land, I murmured. It is our land, and without it, life would not be worth living. Ah, yes, the desert has a strange fascination. 
It is easy out here to believe in the fire god, he said, pushing back his long hair, raven blue as the wing of a wild bird, and held from the eyes by a scarlet headband. Look at those mountain shafts of red rock, torn and shattered and twisted upward. Here is a strange sort of soul magic, a land of weird fascination. A never never land of beauty? I said it was easy to believe in the fire god. See how he crushed and mauled the mountains, then twisted them up. Even the water holes, pool and turquoise, are not always filled with good water. You can tell by looking for the animal skeletons. And the heat waves paint strange pictures for the thirsty. Yes, I too know the desert. You should not have come to us in summer. It is not the time to speak of the ancients, but there are some hints that I can give you. It is well that you move among the nations. Ask the high priest in winter. Perhaps he will not turn his back upon you. If he believes that you are honest and do not come to make fun of these stories. And when you yourself walk the broad land, remember that he was here before you. Learn to see his sign when it is carved in the canyons. Learn to know his name when you hear it spoken. Above all, remember that he loved this beauty, for it must have gripped his heart with talon fingers when, alone in the immensity, he watched the sunrise or the sunset. Remember this when the sun god is painting, and you go forth to speak to the people of Takopa, the healer. Speak of this when you talk to the people, and they will open their hearts to you when they see that your path of life is not crooked, but open and filled with beauty. They will speak and send you away with the blessing. May the great spirit, or, yeah, it's another type of spirit. <laughs> May the great spirit walk with you down a life path of beauty, even as I say it now in our ancient language. Lalomi forever, Lalomi. Speak of this and you speak of the prophet. Speak like this and you will hear of the prophet. All right, now we're going to... Tiburon Island, the Gulf of California. It's called the Untamed Siri. And this is actually the illustration on the back of the book. Can't have story time without showing you guys some pictures. <clears throat> Perhaps to no tribe is the memory of the master more a living thing than it is with the Siri. The shaggy-haired, neglected Seri living in poverty, stricken squalor upon Mexico's Tribur uh, Triburon Island. Still ruled by their sacrificing priesthood are the hardy, untamed Seri, still painting their cheeks with the ancient totem which came north on the balsa migrations. Thousands of years ago, say the chanters, the Seri were part of the serpent people, living together with with the turtles in their powerful ocean homeland, long before the time of the deluge. After the grand disaster, they fled to the land called the Snows of the Southland. Here they built giant cities and called themselves the Men of the Mountains. Underneath their powerful cities were the giant caverns of the serpents. After many ages, a northern army came down and burned those cities, and then the serpents fled through the caverns to where their ships were waiting and took themselves on the seas to other coastlines in a series of long migrations. To them came uh, Tlazoma, the miracle worker, in a canoe which moved by wind power. Well, that's interesting. So now he's, um, I don't know, is this an airplane? Or some sort of um, air-powered device above the ground. He stepped out on the beach in the early dawn. They marveled at his long white toga, his hair and beard gleaming with red lights, and, and his eyes the color of deep sea water. They thought of him as a beautiful teacher who suddenly took on the halo of uh, godhood. That happened on the hour of arrival. A man rushed out and fell before him, crying, Ahunt Azoma, Lord Miracle Worker, for you strange rumors have come to us. Heal these eyes for so long darkened. Bring back my sight of the trees and the flowers, of the sea and the people all about me. The master, stooping quickly, gathered in his hand 
some wet sand and placing over the eyelids of the sightless man said softly, go thee out and bathe in the ocean. With breathless awe, the Siri gathered. Here was the test. If he who had been blinded came back to them seeing, then indeed was a god among them. If not, then there would be a sacrifice for the snake god. The blinded man gave a scream of anguish, then a cry of unutterable joy, and came toward them running wildly, looking at hands full of water and at his curled fingers, at the sea and the sky sobbing wildly, he fell at the feet of the healer. The Seri, watching, fell down in worship, calling, Ahant Azoma, Lord, miracle worker. For many moons, the master lived with them, teaching them how to store their water in their giant clay-baked olas. He taught them how to feed their children after their mother had weaned them, so that fewer would die as little toddlers. He pointed out to them many wild plants that could be prepared for cooking. Up to the time of the prophet's coming, and some say now the tribe controlled its population so that it would not overrun the island or deplete the food supply by allowing no children life beyond that number which the death of elders provided. This ancient law was broken by the master as against the law which he gave them, raised not the knife in bloody slaughter. When the time came for the prophet's going, he called the Siri to sit in council. I am leaving you prosperous and happy, but other tribes need me, so I go to the Papago. Nay, Lord, go not to the Papago. They are an enemy tribe of wicked people. But the master answered, smiling, In my father's land are many lodges. Then tell us, great Ahant Azoma, you speak often of this land of thy father, yet you say not where it lies or in what direction. Softly the bearded one gave his answer. My father's land lies deep within you. All right, so here are the Papago, page 99. For those of you who need caught up. Early one morning against the dawn light, the sandals of the healer came to the village of the Papago. The children had been loudly playing, and when the Lord of Wind and Water, whom the Papago called Isikotl, or Isi, I'll just say Isikot, Isikotl, was seen approaching, the people were embarrassed and roundly rebuked the young ones. Nay, replied the prophet to them in Papago, do not scold the little children, but instead let them come to me, for such is the will of my Father in heaven. Now you can see why initially when She's starting to research these these legends out all across America. She's like, okay, these are clearly stories taught by the the black co- uh, robed people, the, the Jesuits. The, the missionaries came over and they're just blending this with their mythology. But you know, as she started researching this more and more, and she's like, no, I think there's something really to this, right? By the end of her life, according to the uh, biography, the testimony we re- read at the beginning, she is you know, completely convinced that this has merit to it. Every day after that, says the Papago, he met and talked with the children. The prophet did not live among them, but made his home on a distant mountain called Bavoki Vulik, which means the hourglass mountain, for at this time, that was the shape of the mountain. One day, Isi Katal, the healer, wandered into a secret temple where a child was being sacrificed. The eyes of the master went red with anger. He snatched up the baby, healed its gashes, and calling it by name, gave it back its breathing. The priesthood stared and their arms were frozen. They could not move, much as they would have liked to kill him. Stepping outside where the people were gathered, he told them of the secret ceremony, which was against all of his teachings. The people were ashamed but afraid of the priesthood. That night, two priests determined to murder the saintly man who was winning the people. I don't think this is going to turn out too well for them, but let's read to find out. You never know. They stole out in the moonlight for Bavoki Vulik, slipping knives under their blankets. So they're approaching the, the mountain to where he lives alone. The moon was still up, yet the dawn light was coming as they neared the hourglass mountain. In a part of his cave, facing the dawn star, 
The prophet was kneeling in prayer as the two blood priests stole up the mountain. The prophet arose and awaited their coming. As they slipped into the, into the cave with knives uplifted, the Lord of wind and water stepped forth from the cave into the moonlight and faced them in their hiding place in the cave's dark midnight. Why do you not step forth from the cave and kill me? I have no knife nor rod to strike thee. Yet you cannot, even though in the moonlight I stand revealed. Know you not that you cannot kill me until the tasks which were assigned by my father to me upon this earth are finished? Suddenly the earth began to tremble. The roar became deafening, and rocks fell downward, dropping like rain about the prophet. Now the earth shook as if in a spasm, and with the roar of a hundred oceans, the mountain collapsed, leaving the healer standing still on the rock in the moonlight. From within the mountain, he heard two voices pleading for him to go to the village and tell the people how the mountain had entombed them. As the dawn light came, Isi Kato walked into the village. All the people stood staring in fright and awe at Bavoki Vulik and then at the prophet. Where are the priests who came to see, to see you when the fire god shook the mountain? They came with knives before the trembling. They are still within the mountain, and from a great distance you can hear their voices. My father has spoken in the earthquake. Nor, no more am I to live among you. Walking away from them in the dawn light went white-robed Isikotl. Never after did they see him. And then um, I'm trying to figure out what this illustration on here is all about. It says, uh, I need like a magnifying glass to read this. Uh, Machina dance of mountain tribe of Mexico showing both ancient and modern influence. All right. All right. Legend of the Dean, we're on page 102. Or it could be Legend of the Denny. I don't really know. We'll go with Denny. Let's pronounce those two E's. Apologies to anyone from that uh, tribe if I am mis mispronouncing it. On the way toward the people of the Zuni Mahant Azoma met the Denny. These were not the tribes as we know them today called Navajo and Ap Apache, but a lost tribe of the wandering serpents coming northward along the mountains. In the wild red lands of Monument Valley, this tribe of the serpents met the prophet. So, you know, just a side note here, this is really interesting that in her research, uh, now keep in mind, I, this, is, this is coming from one individual and there's going to be biases. I, I'm reading this probably with biases and she has biases and so on and so forth. You know, a lot of us talk about how a lot of the Native American tribes uh, are the lost tribes of Israel, right? Or I call them, you know, now the lost tribes of Tartaria. Uh, but she seems to be attributing them to the 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 serpent people of this this lost Atlantis, but really Atlantis. A lot of people are thinking this is Atlantis. Um, that you know, this great society that was destroyed in the deluge. And I would, you know, have to assume that they would have come through Ham, if we're talking strictly about the, the souls on the Ark, uh, that they're attributed through Ham, that they're the sons of Ham, these are the serpent people. Um, so, you know, take it for what it is, and it's, it's certainly um, a fascinating uh, point of view or perspective. In the wild redlands of Monument Valley, this tribe of the serpents met the prophet. Skeptical of the miracle worker and the fantastic power Men said he commanded as the Lord of wind and water, which they had heard from other nations that Denny questioned his right to that title. Is the power of this one God, whom you call Father, greater than that of the fire God? They questioned, his name no man breathes aloud, or the earth will begin shaking, and the hot rocks burst from the volcanoes. The fire God ever devours his children, even as he destroyed our homeland. My father is a spirit who has no image. His power is greater than any other. Watch, said the prophet, pointing upward. A giant rock, which had been lying near them, half the size of a fallen cliff face, began to rise slowly above them. 
The Denny watched, eyes wide with terror as it swayed and rose like a living thing, like a live thing. For had it fallen, it would have crushed them. Yet it straightened itself up slowly and stood up ended on another rock, gently rocking, slowly rocking, so that a child could have swayed it with a little finger back and forward. That part of the Denny, whom we call Navajo, have another legend. To the prophet, names mean nothing, but they are important to the Denny. So they asked the healer the name of his one God, and when the prophet asked them to name him, they refused, saying that they knew not what name to give him. Then they made a suggestion. Surely in your childhood across the ocean, you were told his name. What name did they tell you? So the Navajo had the name he gave them, Great Yehovah. Today, white man, hearing is deeply puzzled. So the title uh, or the, obviously this is a scene from the cover of the book right there with the white prophet lifting the, the rock and putting it on top of one of the, uh, the mesas there in the uh, Monument Valley region. All right. I'm trying to figure out how much more we're going to read tonight. We'll go a little bit further. And um, so a lot of pictures of the pyramids here. And we saw, if you were following last week, that it appears that she's accrediting some of these pyramids to being built by the white prophet. So some of these pyramids are temples he built. Um, you know, I mean, that's a very different perspective than when we look at them as kind of like ziggurat type things that, you know, were coming out of Mesopotamia, the Tower of Babel, all that kind of stuff. So um, again, you know, uh, it's all things to consider. So the next section, we're on page 106, the Zuni, and I guess that's Yak Yakuai. In the ancient days of the Toltec Empire, the Chihu Wahua Valley was a garden where today is barren desert. The Zuni and Akoma probably held the northern outpost while the Yakwai lived in the general trade routes leading to Tola through the Chihuahua Valley, whose Indian name means the Valley of the Ancient Early Glory. This might have been considered mere wild speculation in the time of our fathers, but today pilots flying over the deserts can trace forgotten dams and aqueducts and see beneath the brush and rubble mounds of unknown giant figures, like these of the mound building civilization which flourished along the Mississippi. So probably there was a connection between the copper mines of Michigan, now buried under a heavy forest cover, which dates them back to the early centuries of what we call the Christian era, and the vast trading empires which flourished in the southward. According to Zuni and Acoma legends, they once held cities along the trade routes, and at that time spoke the same language. The Akoma still speak the Zuni language, the old ones will tell you, but throughout the ages, they have forgotten how to pronounce it. When asked why the late Mexican monarch, Amat Azoma, received the title once given the prophet, the Zuni answered, when he was born, he was pale of feature and in many ways resembled the prophet. When the monarch was grown and the guns of the Spaniards were flaming at the gates of Tenoch Titlan, he sent to the Zuni an urgent appeal for warriors to help stop the white man's invasion. We sent many men, and though long we waited, none ever again came back to Zuni. Now we know that all the, uh, the Mexican armies were killed, and from Tenochtitlan in the valley of old Mexico, our men went to the land of shadows. Why do I call the land Mexico? That is its Aztec name, and the Aztec name for its people. Their war god was Mish Mishitli, and they were really known as the Mexicans. The prophet, he was a great god, a miracle worker, a pure man of dreams and visions. We called him Great Azoma. He came to us on his way to Tola, capital of the Toltec Empire. In those days, we were wealthy, living along the ancient trade route from the Tuans down to Tola. That was long before the serpent invasion from the Southland up the Mississippi or the coyote invasion from the snowland of men carrying an Asian language. Well, that's interesting. The, um, 
the coyote invasion, that's the first we got that bit of information that they were uh, men carrying an Asian language. And these great powers met and battled long until all the land became a wasteland. I, I would you know, argue that that could be your, um, your Manesha right there, Ephraim Manesha uh, coming down through uh, China, uh, you know, Mongolia, Tartaria. The Puans had to flee from their cities. Great Tola then had vanished, and the Pueblo people had to seek the high mesas to get away from the wild northern invaders. Of those times, few men now remember. And over the Chihuahua Valley, where once were, was commerce, now only Tamisha, the fire god, dances in wild dust storms, hurling the hot sand all around him. All right. I am, let's see, do I want to, you know what, I'm going to keep reading. I'm going to keep pushing through. I'm going to try to get to, I have the goal of getting to page 120. I can do this. Tal Sedilio, the Yakwai chieftain. Now, this is called the chant of the Yakwai. A learned man in many languages, student of the Egyptian priesthood, far more learned than his degree, degrees from college, who lost his life fighting as a war chief in the last hopeless rebellion of his people, spoke freely of antiqu antiquity, knowing perhaps that his days were numbered. Yes, well, we knew the prophet. You see, we were the Atlantic serpents carrying on the sacred fire and our sacrificing priesthood. Long before we were converted by this quiet godlike person, he was a man very holy, filled with love, yet his heart was heavy. For in spite of all the honors of the people, the Lord had laid strange vision on, visions on him. His eyes could see the future. It must be so. For as he predicted, all that he spoke of has happened. Today that we go to the white man churches, our true rights are to the prophet. If I go to war, I know it is foolish. Yet I have no choice if my people call me. For I am hereditary war chief and carry the medallion of the great sun. I only hope that when I go to the shadows, the prophet will be understanding. Yes, I will tell you of those days and of Tola, the capital of the Toltec Empire. Wealth we had beyond the counting. Long have we lived in the Chihuahua Valley, whose meaning Chi is for power, and Wa, the very ancient, a land of mighty commerce and blooming gardens. We were the men of the mountains. It was our way of life to use irrigation, and to terrace the hillsides. We brought the water down to the white peaks by means of dams and long covered conduits. We had sewers under our cities. We were a very ancient people. This was the manner of our living from the time beyond the white man histories. Let us return through the cycles of the dawn star to the golden days of the prophet, Mat Azoma, or great Kate Zal. Most fertile was that traveled highway from the lands of the north to the Toltec capital. So lovely was its verdant beauty that it was called the land of the hanging gardens. Orchards and ranches were heavy with verdure, and the great homes built of stucco were cool in summer and warm in winter. Flower and vegetable gardens covered every rounded hilltop where the streams of tinkling water flowed along in man-made channels and birds made the air sweet with music. Along the busy highway stream, the merchants burdened down with things of beauty. From Tola came cloth of fine textured cotton embroidered with pearls and seed silk or gems set in threads of gold work. Some carried paintings done with feathers and some jewel work set in metals. Passing in the other direction from the north came the copper hides and work fashioned in leather or from nearer points flowers or other produce bound for the markets of Tola. From the Northland, where many tales had come before him, at last came the sandals of the prophet. Yes, long before him had come the stories from Seri, Puans, Papago, and Deni, and many wild tribes living in the half-tamed woodland came these tales of wonder. Every merchant brought another, and they lost not one wit in the retelling. Tremendous fame had gone in advance of him before at last he came in person down the road to Tola, welcoming him with open temples. The Yaquai strained to meet the healer. The women competed to weave him mantles, to embroider the crosses about the hemline, and the men to fashion new golden sandals, 
knowing that he would leave the old one, strangely enchanted because of his wearing, a touching of which would heal the body. For him, they stopped all sacrificing. Instead, they used but fruits and flowers to fill their temples, and then placed them on their tables, even as he directed. Indeed, we still try to follow his teaching, although often it is not easy, and many are the times we have turned from him to use the rougher way of the serpent. Yet we know that we are doing wrong. The baptismal, yes, it was the prophet who taught this. The godfather and godmother, with their names of kingship, all must last for the life of the infant. For him, we change our, our ancient dances. We learn new chants and ceremonies. Once our customs were laden with jewels and the finest of plume work was worn for its beauty, but today the people are very poor, often facing gaunt starvation. When we dance now with plumes of paper and bits of glass for the old and jewel work, we know he is understanding and forgiving. And sometimes it seems a spill comes over us and the costumes of paper and glass change slowly in the light of his star to the olden beauty. Once more, the desert becomes Chihuahua and we see him pause on his way to Tola. Yeah, I guess I got to keep reading now because now we're going into Tola. So I got I to gotta finish that up. Hold on here, I need a little bit more tea. Thank you all for your uh, patience as we go through this. I hope you guys are enjoying this. Now, the, okay, this is, this is in Mexico. It's called Tola the Golden. Now, all the titles of the prophet began to converge upon him as he neared the Toltec Empire. He was indeed the man of the hour. Before him lay the fabled city known to men as Golden Tola, capital of mighty Tolan. Immense, immensely wealthy were the Toltecs. Slaves and jewels without number came through the mosaic gateways, resplendent in their pearl and emerald. Vast were their chocolate plantations. That sounds lovely. Endless their orchards of various fruit trees. Stout grew their amaranth stalks, their nuts and beverages, most delicious. How many of those beverages have chocolate in them, do you think? and many other delicacies which today the Toltecs are lacking, being lost during the passage of the ages. As in the kingdoms of the Andes, cotton grew in all the colors of the rainbow and there was no need to dye it. So large were the Toltec corn ears that it took a man to lift them. And the kind which has come to us through the ages of war and pillage is but the scrub corn grown by the Toltecs to heap their boughs of perfumed water. Thousands of animals were bred by the Toltecs, from deer and buffalo to coons and rabbits. They had large flocks of geese and turkeys, ducks and other types of fowl. Many meats were in their markets and all men had a great abundance. Of the future, features most remembered were the miles of fragrant parkways, filled with the sound of splashing fountains and the scent of exquisite flowers. Here the trees were filled with music because these enclosures were wire netted and thousands of birds whose liquid voices had been specially bred for untold generations lived there to enchant the listener. Here, too, were kept birds of rare plumage. Here the bluish, I can't even pronounce that, it's a bird, glowing like a living turquoise, or again the tla uh, quickle, a creature livid as the fire flame, or that which flew white and wraith-like, as lovely as a sudden frozen snowflake. Those sound like bizarre birds. I don't even know what those are. Crowning them all through the Kate Zoll, symbol of the breath of the heavens. Languorously posed the Kate Zoll, whose tail the length of a mighty warrior was the jeweled badge of a hundred monarchs. Here it floated in easy freedom from tree to tree with uh, iridescent luster. Strangely skillful were the Toltecs in the fashioning of metals, gold and silver, bronze and copper, and the finest of double plating was the art of their clever jewelers. Birds of silver that danced and twittered, and feather plumes of such a delicate beauty that many asked what birds had grown them, were on display in their jewel jewelry markets. Wealth unheard of was gathered in Tola. Palaces that were frescoed with pearls, Edifices worked from coral, temples covered with the finest of gold work and edged with jade were among their wonders. Even their streets were paved 
with metal. That's interesting. The buildings were paved in gold. The streets were paved in metal. Such was the fabulous golden metropolis whose fame had spread through a thousand nations and whose sight lingered on in memory in uncounted firelight legends for untold years after its fall and pillage. Such was the world's most beautiful city when the prophet came to Tola. One more. Mexico, entrance into Tola. I think we'll end it there tonight. Hopefully it will not end on a cliffhanger. When the prophet came to Tola, he was in the peak of his glory because his fame had come like a ghost before him, before ever his sandals of gold had led him along the highway to Tola. It is said that he paused on the passes, gazing long upon the golden rooftops, glowing in the early morning sunrise like a frozen sea of lava glistening in copper gold eruption. This sounds like an amazing city. It's a city literally paved in gold. And the rooftops would just shimmer with that. I just trying to imagine that. Already everywhere the people were waiting, covering the land up to the mountains, lining the highways, singing and chanting. The stories had brought out the masses from a thousand miles far distant and emptied all the towns and villages. Long had they known that he loved flowers, and now they filled the air with perfume, raining blossoms down upon him. This rain grew thicker as he moved toward Tola. Heavy flower carpet carpets paved the highway. Roses, violets, tiger lilies, moon roses, golden poppies, showy hibiscus, and dewy orchards lay in the most intricate patterns, most mosaic before the tread of his sandals. Then as soon as he had walked over them and the people ran out and scrambled for them, hoping to keep a single petal which might have borne his weight for a moment. From far beyond the outer ramparts stretched the homes of stucco, the edifices and markets of distant Tola. Some were built on the pyramid order where one man's roof is another's garden. Usually they were filled with ferns and flowers for the Toltecs loved their beauty and tinkling streams of tumbling water which ran down a hard tiled stream bed from roof to roof. Now they were filled with Toltecs. So literally the rivers are flowing like over the rooftops and there's just like gardens growing around it. It sounds amazing. Then at last he came to the great wall. There in black and orange, gray and crimson, blue and raspberry, every possible hue of rainbow moved the costumes of the Toltecs flashing with their jeweled embroideries as they changed their places or rose to see him better. Along the wall, holding over a hundred thousand people, the prophet moved toward the gateway where waited the courtiers and the monarch, resplendent in their plumed headdresses to escort him into Tola. At the gateway, he paused a moment to gaze upon its fabulous beauty. Then he passed through the ponderous portals of metal, encrusted with their pearls and emerald, and from the throats of a million people came a roar like to an ocean, bursting through the mouths of the Toltecs as the monarch bowed low before him and escorted him into Tola the Golden. He was led to the great hill of loud outcrying, known of old as Zazitepec, the last word meaning mountain, which then towered above the Golden City. From here, he was given a seat of honor where he could watch the ceremonial dances given in his honor with the dancers chanting the Toltec welcome. But it was when he started to speak that a miracle happened. Never before to a great distance could the voice of one man be carried, but from the hilltop to beyond the city, to the wall and on to the mountains went forth his beautiful voice, his musical voice speaking in Toltec. It is said that after his greeting, he plainly derided the masters, calling on them to renounce slavery. Do you expect, the healer said, to enter into the gates of heaven, carried upon the backs of your servants? Then he spoke of their enemy people in the light of understanding. He told them of his distant travels and why there should not be war and pillage. He told them of these people they hated and how with only love he had tamed them. No one who ever stood in his presence had heard that voice of compelling magic, which swept away all opposition could ever again forget the healer. And so it was that day in Tola, the head plumes of the Toltecs were bowed and in mass where they converted.
All right, I'm going to end it there. Uh, we read nearly 60 pages tonight. Well, maybe 50 something. And um, good. So I don't know if anybody uh, had any questions or I see you guys were writing things down the whole time. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to read them. But um, we will end it here tonight and then we'll pick up next Thursday night and we'll see if we can make it all the way through the book. We'll get at least very close to doing so. And I hope you guys all enjoyed that. I, I certainly enjoyed it. I, I was really engaged. I mean, just line for line in there and gave me a lot to think about. So with that, we're going to officially end it. I'm going to meet you guys over in the voice chat and I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. Thank you.